They are the real-life heroes who save our lives. But they are heroes with confessions. The paramedics. Little did that patient know what had been going on five minutes before they sat on that stretcher. <laughs> the nurses. Sometimes it is quite tempting, you know, just to have a, a peek when no one's looking. And the doctors. Everyone assumes that doctors and nurses are slightly different and they have this strict professional code of conduct. But I think the key message is that the doctors and nurses are human. And they're not all saints. The way to deal with somebody who just keeps ringing the buzzer is to simply take the buzzer away from them. <laughs> I think the general public would be really shocked when they see how doctors and nurses really behave. The thing I hate about the, the medical soaps is they have these incredibly dedicated doctors who will, you know, they'll cry and bleed with each and every one of pa their patients and they'll go with their patient into hospital. And you can't do that in real life. I think everybody on TV is very serious all the time and it's all very intense. And I think we, I just think, oh gosh, lighten up, have some fun, for goodness sake. A real life hospital is a far cry from the rose tinted world of medical soaps. Yes, the staff do a great job most of the time. But, well, just occasionally, some of them do things they shouldn't. The thing about injections is I can control how painful they are. Annoy me, they can hurt a lot. The great myth of modern healthcare is that the patient has choice and is at the centre of all things. And there might be a wonderful idea, but it's an absolute nonsense. The only choice a patient is likely to get is over whether or not they get semolina or custard for pudding, and only then if they're really going to shout a lot about it. You're unlikely to receive any sympathy if you go in expecting the red carpet treatment. There are unwritten rules for dealing with badly behaved patients. There's so many ways you can get your own back, really, without going over the line, the professional line, really. I mean, one of the ways um, I've done is you walk up to the patient who's really annoying you or annoying everyone else, put an apron on, a pair of gloves, and walk up to him with an enema and just say, right, it's your turn. And that scene shuts them up. It may sound harsh, but some patients really are asking for it. You just would not believe the, the sort of people that call out a 999 ambulance. They demand things from you. They want you to be their servant. It's not unheard of for a, for a man, a grown man, to call out an ambulance because he's had a bad dream. Overly nice, manipulative. Or for someone that's broken an owl. Particularly fussy and everything has to be a particular way. Their budgery guards died or their dog's been run over. Suddenly they lose the ability to reach out and pour themselves a glass of water. And we've had finger clickers as well. Like, go, go. When two beds down, somebody is dying of liver disease, all of the resources that are available are going to focus and going to prioritise on what the patient's biggest needs are. You might think that it's all right to be aggressive and abusive, but it isn't. You're going to get ignored, or maybe even worse. I mean, there's some obnoxious patients you can really get even with. Um, the, most, the, the injection that stings the most strangely is a local anaesthetic. Um, it, I mean, it really, really stings. And it's one of those where the quicker you give it, the worse it's going to sting. And of course, you use a bigger needle so that more of it goes in all at once, and which makes it hurt even more. This painful method of discipline can be administered before you even arrive at hospital. You know, they don't know enough about medicine to question you. They don't think that, they wouldn't dare say, you know, what are you doing, why are you doing that? But you can, like, set a drip up on someone that doesn't need one, set a really large cannula, a large needle in them. I think it's the, the four of it when you're actually getting the needle ready and preparing it and they see the size of it and um, they soon stop the insults and then they soon calm down. Controlling patients can take many forms and if a bed needs to be freed up, a more subtle approach is needed. We had this man who used to feign unconsciousness and one night he came in and he was on the trolley and I put him in a side room and took off his socks and shoes and painted his toenails bright red. And about two weeks later, he came back in on the trolley, completely unconscious, new ambulance crew, didn't know who he was. And I just went up to him and whispered in his ear, guess who's on duty? And he leapt off the trolley, taking his airway out himself and asked the ambulance men for a lift back into town. We had a lady come into A&E who was dressed up to the nines and she only had a tiny cut on her head, but she was absolutely stroppy about it and demanded to be seen straight away. And we decided, well, we had to use super glue to glue the, the two bits of skin back together and we decided to glue the glove to her head, which we did. And we glued it so that the middle finger was sticking up and it was glued to her head and all the other fingers had rested down. And, and then we said that we had a major emergency and we had to clear the casualty out and she had to go back out and sit in the waiting area 
amongst all those other people with the glove attached to her head. And she was extremely annoyed about that. But I think the humiliation of sitting there with the glove kind of sorted her out, really. We did take it off later, about an hour later. And don't even think about being a sex pest. Because the remedies can be quite painful. There's the, the men who think they're God's gift to women and you're just there to pamper them and sort their every whim out. Oh, you know, give us a bed bath nurse, that sort of thing. To dampen a randy patient's spirits, nothing works quite like inserting a catheter tube into their private parts. We had a young guy come in for uh, just a normal knee operation. And, um, but unfortunately, he was really randy, the kind that, you know, if you walk past him, you'd have to nip your butt and do that sort of thing. And he, you know, we decided to get back at him because we thought, you know, he's such a horrible person. And we thought, right, you know, we have to find a way to stop him from actually thinking about anything like that. So we thought, right, the four of us, the four student nurses, we got behind the curtain and we said to him, look, you know, we've, we're going to have to catheterize you. So we showed him the catheter and he was horrified. And he said to us, well, but there's nothing wrong with me down there. And we said, well, well, it's doctor's orders, I'm afraid. And we were meant to um, use a local anaesthetic, but we didn't. We shoved it in. We, you know, he was in complete agony, bless him. And, um, and then we decided that, you know, to, in order that he wouldn't be able to move from his bed, we tied the catheter to the end of the bed so he wouldn't be able to leave it. <laughs> Some patients have a real power trip once they get their pyjamas and nighties on. They get the buzzer in their hand and that's it. You, you become their personal assistant. You just get so fed up with that noise. I mean, you hear it when you go home and you hear it in your sleep. It's just constant buzz, buzz. The buzzers just go non-stop and you go from buzzer to buzzer to buzzer. The way to deal with somebody who just keeps ringing the buzzer is to simply take the buzzer away from them. <laughs> And I've definitely done that. Because <laughs> you know, if they're really ill, you never do that. But by the time they're getting to a buzzer pest, you know they're just being a damn nuisance, so <laughs> fair game. Away from hospital duties, staff will often exploit resources in the name of fun. One of the job's best assets is the uniform. I really don't like my uniform. However, on the outside, it can really work wonders. What is it about nurses? Nurses, nurses. It's always nurses and uh, French maids, isn't it? The cliché. And there is something about a nurse's uniform that turns men on, so I, I don't think any nurse would deny that. My husband always says to me, oh, go on, go and put your uniform on. <laughs> but he's an ex-soldier as well, so I go and tell him to put his on. <laughs> But yeah, you can, you can play up to it. I mean, it's, it's a bit annoying when people do portray you as being, you know, the sexy nurse with the, the little short skirt uniform on, but, you know, you, it can work to your advantage, definitely. If you actually walked into a pub with your uniform on, my God, you got every drink bought for you. You know, so, I mean, it used to be one of the things we used to do quite a lot as well, so we could get our drinks bought for us. I might have trouble passing my driving test, and I kind of got to about the fourth attempt and still hadn't passed it, so I thought, right, I'll stick my nurse's uniform on. And uh, I mean, it didn't work. I still failed it, but um, I got out of the car and the in examiner said, well, good, good try. <laughs> the heady mix of young people and uniforms is enough to send passions rising. Well, if you see a hospital in a street, you look up at that hospital, guaranteed there is mischief of some sort of sexual nature going on in that hospital. I mean, you've got 22, 23, 24 year old people, maybe away from home for the first time, dealing with life and death, life and death of your relatives and my relatives, and all of the emotions that come with that. And they might well be in a, a big city with some new people, and they're gonna party, and they're really gonna party well. There was one particular time, there's many particular times, but the one I'll tell you about was a, a funny one because it got interrupted and that was um, a couple of colleagues in the back of the vehicle doing what you do in the back of a vehicle that's got a bed and a job came through. So I had to discreetly, embarrassingly, try and tell the couple to call off and uh, drive in there. All I could say was that <laughs> there was bodies being thrown from one side of the vehicle to the other as they tried to put their ties on, do their skirt and their trousers up and get themselves ready and ready looking professional for your professional ambulance service. Little did that patient know what had been going on five minutes before they sat on that stretcher. 
<laughs> One of the most scandalous moments of my training was when a fellow student nurse was actually asked to leave, having got herself pregnant um, by a patient, which in itself is, is pretty shocking. But then when I discovered that it was an orthopedic patient who has, was in a hip spiker, which is basically a plaster from the waist down both legs with a broom handle across to separate the legs. It was quite a feat. Sex isn't the only temptation. There's also lots of equipment to play with. Sometimes, you know, especially as a student, you try and find out what things feels like as a patient and you'll try out the laughing gas maybe and just to get an idea of what it's actually like. It's great. <laughs> it is good. <laughs> And of course, there's the deluxe vehicles at your disposal. I mean, if you're sitting in traffic, no one wants to sit in traffic anyway. You just press your buttons and your blue lights are on you two times and you're off. So uh, we get a bit of an advantage that way. And yeah, it's a perk rather than abuse. I mean, who wants to sit in traffic when you can just put your lights on and get through and get either home or get back? When it's not being used to cut through traffic, the ambulance has other unofficial uses. Look at the size of an ambulance. It's a small van or a large van, however you put it. I mean, take the stretchers out and you can fit two double wardrobes, two single beds, a double bed, a washing machine, a fridge freezer, and whatever. I mean, we've done it. We've moved someone from one end of London to another in an eight-hour shift whilst doing emergency calls. Coming up in part two, when doctors make mistakes. Had the drip been working properly, it would have killed her. It would have gone straight to her heart. And having a laugh at your expense. With amputations especially, the surgeon will, you know, play a trick on the little student nurse standing in the corner watching, you know, and throw a leg at them. Mistakes are inevitable in any profession, and hospitals are no exception. So keep your fingers crossed that your doctor is well rested and that your nurse is having a good day. The problem with medication is a lot of the bottles look the same and you have to be really careful not to get them mixed up. Medical mishaps are incredibly common and the, I think the sad thing is that most of them are basic bread and butter, simple mistakes that, that didn't need to happen. You make a mistake in the pizza hut and somebody doesn't get the right tomato on their pizza. You make a mistake in the hospital and something bad happens. Um, but it's a human error. I think like any job, I mean, when you work in enough hours, a lot of hours and a lot's going on and you're going from one call to another call to another call, it's inevitable that you're going to make mistakes and mistakes are made. And those simple mistakes can happen before you even make it to hospital. Sometimes when your first job comes through and you look and you've got no map book, you've got no, no A to Z. <laughs> so you put your blue lights on and you head in the general direction of the postcode and um, a couple of times we've been caught and we had to actually stop at a garage, look in our A to Z discreetly, turn in your blue lights off, having a look, trying to remember as much as possible and then getting as near to, you, near to the um, scene as possible and asking people and then getting there and coming up with every excuse like um, we, we only got the call three minutes ago. I made a classic mistake when I was a student and I was doing a locum house job and a woman came in who, who had a, a drip in her arm and it needed flushing through because it had blocked off. And the potassium and the sodium bottles looked exactly the same and they were kept in exactly the same drawer. And it was three o'clock in the morning and I picked up potassium rather than sodium to flush it through. And had the drip been working properly, it would have killed her, it would have gone straight to her heart. Fortunately, it wasn't. And she just got this pain in her arm from me flushing potassium in and went, oh my God, it hurts, it hurts. Now, instead of me saying, I'm terribly sorry, I've made a mistake there, I've put the wrong drug in, I said, oh, you must be allergic to salt water. I'll go and write that in the notes and covered it up, which is exactly what all my mates would have done. In an emergency situation, it all doesn't all go smoothly like that and everybody knows what they're doing and everybody can put their hand on the saline or whatever it is they need. You're flapping around, you don't know where anything is, you can't think straight. And I particularly really flap. I'm like, oh my goodness, he's dropping his blood pressure. Oh my goodness, get the doctor. When in a flap, even something simple like left and right can be confusing. Occasionally working in theatres, you, you see people who've come down and, and the wrong leg gets marked or the wrong limb gets marked. And the, the funniest one I can think of is this gentleman who came down who had already had an amputation in the past. So he had a false leg on. And the medical officer who marked his leg must have been really tired that day because he marked his false leg. In fact, there are some people who say when you go into hospital, take a marker pen in and do it yourself. 
Make sure you know which side it is and put a big mark on yourself and don't, don't rely on other people marking you up. Left and right, even life and death, it can all get mixed up. If you're talking about misdiagnosis and cock-ups, I think the misdiagnosis of death is quite an interesting one. Uh, and on several occasions, a colleague of mine I was working with at the time was called to see a woman, extremely large woman, who didn't appear to be breathing. And often when people are very large, it's quite hard to tell. He couldn't feel a pulse. So he certified her dead and asked the nurses to phone up the relatives um, and tell them. He was then bleeped back to the ward five minutes later to see this woman sitting up in bed, drinking a cup of tea and reading The Sun. So technically she was still dead. But uh, when the relatives came in and demanded to know what had happened, and there were all sorts of options. You could say, oh, it's the nurses. They phoned the wrong relatives. They made a mistake. And he decided to accept it. And he said to the nurses, we see, said to the relatives, there are different stages of death. Yeah, there's slightly alive, slightly dead, and they've come back. With mortality and illness, a hospital is not the most suitable place for humour. But often it's necessary, even if it's at your expense. Within the nursing industry, I think it's accepted that you can laugh at something that's not funny because they know you're not being vindictive or vicious. It's just, I think it is a coping mechanism. You have to have a laugh at patients on occasion. That doesn't mean you don't care. It means you would go mad if you didn't do it. In orthopaedic theatres, you know, with amputations especially, the surgeon will, you know, play a trick on the little student nurse standing in the corner watching, you know, and throw a leg at them or, you know, throw an arm or, or whatever they're amputated, you know, and you'll be expected to catch it. I was in theatre and there was an elderly lady who was quite ill. She had a medical condition which meant that she couldn't have a full general anaesthetic. So they gave her a local anaesthetic, which meant that she was aware the whole time through the operation. Anyway, it's quite a, quite a quick operation. The surgeon cut her leg off, basically, and um, then said, bag, I was, a bag was thrust in my hand, and he basically locked the leg at me. And um, I just remember standing there. I mean, a leg is quite heavy anyway. It was a lady's leg, so God knows what it'd be like if it was a man's leg, but just that's horrific, you know, for somebody to do that. The rest of the staff who've seen it a hundred times before just think it's really funny to see the horror on a student nurse's face when that happens. You know, but, you know, to the outside world, that would be seen as being really quite awful. <laughs> Sometimes that cavalier approach to unconscious patients can go a bit too far. You would be invited in as a student to examine patients under anaesthetic without their consent. And this would go for vaginal examinations or rectal examinations. The patient wouldn't be consented. And a line of medical students would turn up with rubber gloves and, you know, just go, ooh, yeah, ooh. Clearly, grossly unethical, and in fact, it's still happening in a few medical schools. They've tried to stamp it out. And, and it was this idea that here's this poor patient who's a slab of meat, and oh, we've got to do 10 vaginal examinations to get our box ticked. And so, you know, all of a sudden, we'll all line up. However, you're more likely to draw a crowd for the staff's amusement, particularly with male patients, when something embarrassing starts to rise under anaesthetic. Everyone just laughs because you, you, know, you can't do anything with it because you have to wait for it to go back down. Um, we do some really naughty things as well, actually. We, um, you have to hit it to get it to come down. And everyone, you know, you take turns. It's like, here we go, ping. Oh, does it come down? No, oh, no, it's going up. Oops. <laughs> it's just one of those things. <laughs> I know if I had appendicitis, they'd laugh at your knob. I mean, I, you know, I know. That's just tough. Sometimes it is quite tempting, you know, just to have a, a peek when no one's looking. You know, if they've come back from surgery and they're unconscious still from the anaesthetic, you know, it is quite tempting just to help them have a little wash, maybe, <laughs> to have a little pee. <laughs> God, I can't believe I said that. <laughs> Even patients' possessions can raise a smile, especially when they're found in unexpected places. We're not talking carrots here, we're talking turnips, potatoes. I mean, the bigger, the better. Mobile phones, hoovers. Vegetables, bottles bottle tops, toilet roll holders, candles, paper toilet roll tubes, um, oh god, all sorts of broken glass. I think the most interesting thing I've seen inserted into a back passage was a light bulb. Uh, that was um, unusual. And we had this great x-ray of a light bulb in the back passage. A little nurse walked by and said, ooh, how does anyone swallow a light bulb? So you sort of missed the point of it. The rumour goes around the department very, very quickly and everyone wants to have a look and see. And, you know, if people do have to go to theatre to have things removed, then you're sort of volunteering to go and observe. For those operations, the ones that weren't routine, the porters almost became like ticket touts because you could, for some reason, go in there and say, oh, is it OK if uh, my friend comes in and just has a look at this? And the consultants normally are very easy about that. 
When you go into hospital, you will hear many medical terms being bandied about, but not all of them appear in the textbooks. Doctors love pigeonholing people, so they used to speak in acronyms. Um, uh, my particular favourite is one called T.F. Bundy. They used to write down, you don't see much of it now, because of course if they're read out in the courts, they're not so funny, but T.F. Bundy stands for totally nasty word beginning with F, but unfortunately not dead yet. And that was a sort of a pejorative term for somebody who was on their last legs. I mean, I saw in a patient's notes once, um, the surgeon <laughs> had actually written, this man was actually covered, had lots and lots of body hair. I mean, he's just a very hairy person. And the surgeon actually wrote in the notes, um, very hairy man, probably a werewolf and <laughs> underneath. The classic one was a friend of mine worked for a gynaecologist in Bristol who tried to perform a womb scrape on a very large lady uh, and wasn't able to. She was too large. And he wrote back to the GP saying, oh, dear sir, I I'm afraid I'm not able to perform this womb scrape without the aid of a miner's lamp and a canary. Uh, and that's probably the rudest thing I've ever heard written in somebody's notes. So there's the odd joke at your expense. But remember, it's never at the expense of your treatment. Just because we have a strange sense of humour, just because we do all these strange things, doesn't mean we're not giving the most professional care that we can give. While it may seem horrific or a little bit brutal, it isn't really. And I think that's always the context that you need to see all these stories in, really. We have to laugh, I guess. It's either laugh or, you know, get depressed about it, so we laugh. The inner workings of a hospital may seem strange to the outsider, but it's all part of getting the patient better and back out through the doors on the road to recovery.